get on. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll, and if you want us to get out of the way. Yeah, if everyone wants to go, and I'll just call you up when you're ready to go. Check, 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 check. Yeah. If if everyone could uh, if everyone could come up a, a a lot of rows, we'll try and fill up the front. We can even we can even dim the lights for you if you want. Yeah. We want those people at home to know that this is where the party is. So come on up close. First five rows would be great. Quantifiable number. Hello? All right, well, uh, thank you all for coming out to the song portion of the Song and Score Symposium. Um, presumably, you guys are writers of songs, singers of songs, or just lovers of songs. Um, we have a real talented panel to give you a broad perspective on what the industry is like now, where it's coming from, where it's going, and uh, maybe some things you didn't know was possible in the world of songwriting. Um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, John Snyder here to say a few words about the center, which is putting on this wonderful event. John Snyder. I feel like I know everybody in this, this room, but you know, the Center for Music and Arts Entrepreneurship is an organization that's, that's run by the music industry program here. And the name of the game is to try to help young people and others monetize their love for music. So this idea that we have going on today is, wow, was that film scoring thing amazing or something? These people were so impressive yeah. and so generous. <laughs> So anybody who wants to go to L.A. and study with Chris Young, my goodness, he said, hey, here's my number, come live with me. That's pretty hard to beat, so I say we get a bus to go out there. <laughs> so uh, I'm not going to say much more, but uh, John has done a great job uh, organizing this with our production uh, team. We have a production company of students who uh, put on events for us, and uh, very um, uh, you know, hardworking young people who are determined to succeed and we're just really proud to be in their presence. So I'm going to turn it back over to John, and thank you very much for coming today, and we hope you enjoy what you're getting ready to see and hear. Thank you. Okay. Uh, our first speaker, I am so excited to present this guy to you. Uh, he is currently the president of Nashville, Nashville Songwriters Association International. If there's a guy who knows what's going on in the world of songwriting, where it's coming from, where it's going, uh, and the city where, if you're going to be a songwriter, uh, you may have to at least know about, uh, Nashville, um, this guy this guy knows what's up. Please join me in welcoming Steve Bogard. We happening? Now we are. Okay. Well, hi. Uh, very uh, nice to be here. Nice to be invited. Thank you, John. Thank you, John Paul. Um, I'm having to do a little cheat sheet here because uh, John Paul asked me such uh, cutting edge questions that, uh, you know, well, what's up now? Well, what time is it? Uh, the, the, the laws are changing every minute. And, and you know, the, the film panel used that metaphor of uh, <clears throat> being the best blacksmith in the world and watching a Model T go by. And the, the analogy I would use for, for people your age in, in this, this particular time is that we're at a Gutenberg moment. The dark ages is, are done, and somebody invented the printing press. And, and so we've all got to figure things out and change everything. And I can give you just a little background on, uh, on myself. I'm, uh, uh, I have a, a vocation and an avocation. My vocation is uh, I'm a songwriter and have been a song, professional songwriter really my whole life. Um, about 10 number ones, a couple Grammy nominations. Um, I'm on the new George Strait record. <laughs> 100, million, 100 million CDs and, and, and uh, 
uh, cuts, uh, at least 300 cuts, by, by various artists from Etta James to the Four Tops to George Strait to Rita Coolidge to Tim McGraw. So I, uh, my story is uh, probably similar to a lot of people. I was a, a, a guitar player, started a band. We got on TV, nobody could write, so I decided to try. Nobody could sing, so I decided to try. And uh, we got a record deal when I was about 16 and uh, moved to, I moved to Memphis, then followed Atlantic Records and got a staff writing deal in Miami when uh, Criteria, when they were cut, I was there when they cut Layla and, and all those, uh, Spirit in the Dark for Aretha and that sort of thing. Um, stayed in Miami when Atlantic left uh, and started a family and did some jingles and film scores. Then in 83, a song that I had written 11 years ahead, of, 11 years prior, uh, I wrote a, a song with uh, Mike Utley, who's the keyboard player for the Coral Reefers. I wrote a song because a, a group came into the studio and they were called Tommy Latham and the Traveling Magic. And so I said to my buddy Utley, we were still in our teens, I said, uh, look, if we, they only have one song. If we, if we just write something with the word magic in it, they're sure to cut it. They got to have a B-side. Back then you had to have a B-side. So uh, we wrote a song called Touch Me With Magic and then 11 years later, the publisher dug, dug it up, handed it to Marty Robbins, and uh, it was a top 10 hit for him. It was my first BMI award. <clears throat> I found out about it sitting in the control room of a recording studio because I read it in Billboard. So if, if, you, don't, if you don't think that, that there's serendipity and luck and it's all the stuff that these guys said about, just putting yourself out there, just go, go for it. Those kinds of things really, really do happen. So uh, I won a BMI award and told my wife I thought it was too far to go for dinner, so I didn't show up to pick it up. And I was playing gigs in Miami. And, uh, and uh, uh, when I got the award, and then when I got the checks, I figured it out a little, a little better. And we moved to Miami in, uh, I mean, to Nashville in 83. Um, had my first number one in 87. Uh, the business is very different than it was then. <clears throat> the, uh, the business then was a lot about writing standalone songs, standalone writers, writing specifically to pitch to eight or ten other, other folks. That, that part of the business is, it still exists, but it is definitely on the wane. So, so the song slinger, the, the multi-talented songwriter who can, who can do lyrics, who can use the craft, to enhance an artist's vision is much more um, how it works today. Um, I got to write a couple songs with Dirk Bentley. Um, started early in his career, uh, writing with him, a couple album cuts, a couple more album cuts, and then a couple of Grammy nominations. Writing with Dirks, using his sensibilities, but bringing the, the craft and the, and the skills that I learned over years. Uh, working uh, on, on songwriting. Um, the avocation part of what I do is, uh, is the National Songwriters Association, or NSAI. We have a, it's a uh, nonprofit lobbying group. It's the perfect circle of, and synergy of uh, celebrating songs, which, uh, shameless plug, end of the month, uh, this, this month, end of March, 1st of April, we're having Tin Pan South, which is the world's largest songwriter festival. Uh, it's in Nashville at eight, nine venues this year. Nine venues, two shows a night uh, for those five nights with uh, writers in the round. It's kind of a Nashville thing. You've probably seen it. You know, everybody sits around with guitars. Every show is completely unique because sometimes the writers know each other. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they're great musicians and play along and jam, and sometimes they, they really suck. And, they still play along and jam and make noises, but it's a uh, it's it's a great deal. So we celebrate, we educate. We got 150 regional workshops, including one here in New Orleans, um, and uh, we uh, try to help aspiring songwriters hone their craft, learn how it works. We really try to help them learn the business end of it, the monetization end of it, um, because th that's a very uh, uh, very misunderstood and, on the surface, difficult 
part of the business. So one thing I would encourage you to do is we gave out some brochures. If, if you can get a hold of NSAI, get online, just check it out. Check out the website. The dues aren't very expensive. We are nowhere in the royalty uh, chain at all. We don't, we're out of the royalty chain, which is one of the reasons we can do the third of our three things, which is, ad, which is uh, advocate. And uh, I just got back from Washington, D.C. We're, uh, we've had over 3,000 individual visits to Congress uh, to, with members and with, uh, and with staffers. We come in with small gangs, two, three, four of us, usually with a guitar. We usually uh, either have an issue or we just come to say hello and explain what's going on in the songwriting business right now, which is not all good news, but there's some good news. Um, we explain that, and then we usually end with a song. And we, we play them a song, and, and uh, I don't know if you've ever been to Congress, but it's like a rabbit warren. It's like all underground and not a lot of good news. And so you bring these folks a song, and you got a friend. They, uh, especially if it's a song they've heard, they, they just they go nuts. It's like a big party because you played them a song. It's nothing to us, but it's a big deal to them. So some of the ways that monetization has changed, the, the, main, the main thing is the demise of the mechanical royalty. Songwriters make money, uh, songwriters and publishers make money two ways. Mechanicals, which is, tri well, three ways. Synchronization as well. Mechanicals, which is anything involving a physical sale a digital download, anything involving exchange of money, sales. The other half of the, of the pie is performance, which is your PROs, your performing rights organizations, um, BMI, ASCAP, CSAC, which you heard about. Um, the other PRO that, that uh, these gentlemen didn't mention, that you, those of you who are performers or have bands, are going to want to think about in the, in the coming uh, years, and even now, is a, a PRO called Sound Exchange which collects, there are two copyrights. There's the underlying work, and there's the master sound recording. So at this point in America, we don't pay royalties for terrestrial television and, and radio, regular traditional. We do pay royalties for all things digital. Anything on the satellite or, or uh, uh, internet, we pay royalties to the performer. As a matter of fact, one of, one of the best cutting edge uh, uh, music platforms, Pandora, um, pays is, is very proud of paying almost 50% of their uh, income out in royalties. Now, unfortunately for songwriters, only four cents of that goes to, this, to the underlying work, the songwriting part of it. 46 uh, cents of that, percent of that goes out to the master, rec holders of the master recording, owners of the master recording, which is the record labels the principal performer, and a small piece goes to the background musicians and the singers. So you want to think about sound exchange, too, when you, when you think about, about PROs. When, uh, when the record labels didn't hire Sean Fanning 12 years ago, uh, they made the biggest mistake that's ever been made in the history of music, because they could have just got him on board and figured it all out and monetized the file sharing. Well, they didn't. So the industry's been playing a really bad game of catch up ever since. And uh, the record industry's done itself some harm by suing its own customers. Seemed like a good idea at the time to them. Um, the, it's taken 10 to 12 years for the world and the US, our US Congress, to actually figure out that this was a damaging situation for intellectual property. They, they think piracy, the, the, the uh, International Chamber of Commerce put a price tag on piracy worldwide of film and TV, of film and, uh, and music at $750 billion a year. They think it'll be $1.5 trillion by 2015. So I always like to say there's a big super tanker, which if this is true, there's a super tanker that goes from China to the US every three days. It comes over full. It's, it's just for Walmart. Walmart only takes three days, goes 40 knots, goes back empty. What it should be going back with is little Bugs Bunnies, little Dirk Bentleys, little George Straits, little 
little Beyonce's, little holograms of, of them, and we should be making the money from that. But we haven't quite figured that out, that out yet. There's a new, I was just in D.C. this week. There's a new, strong new anti-piracy bill in the Senate that will shut down overseas websites that are, doing, that are uh, making money, selling content they don't own, and then not paying any royalties. But anyway, that's the two, that's the two uh, streams. The big change in, in music for, for a songwriter, if you wanted to be a standalone songwriter, for example, uh, not an, by that I mean not an artist or performer, is that when the mechanical royalties stream began to diminish, record businesses lost 20% every year for the last five years. When that mechanical stream began to diminish, then publishers, who are our business partners, didn't get the royalties that they use to keep songwriters from having to deliver pizzas quite so much. They, they, typically, 12 years ago, a, a reasonably good songwriter could have, could have commanded what's called a draw, which is an advance against your royalties, uh, that would comfortably support a family. Um, not so much anymore. Uh, there's, it still exists. Um, publishers really like to, like to sign um, young, good-looking artists that they think can get a record deal because the way of the future is artist writers. It's, it's, a very, it's a very strong trend. It doesn't mean it's a, it's a bad thing. I would hate to see, personally hate to see the standalone songwriter disappear because the, some of the big songs like I Hope You Dance Somewhere Over, some of the big uh, giant hits were written by standalone songwriters and are, are the kinds of copyrights that, that translate to 20 or 30 different artists and last a long time. I have an Etta James song um, called Damn Your Eyes that I wrote that's been in, uh, it was never a big radio hit, but it's been in eight or nine movies. And, uh, and uh, Etta does it live all the time. So uh, those, the, the emotion and the process of writing a song just for the joy of it being a great song without any real, it's, it's not a work for hire, it's not something you're, you're trying to do in, in order to fit into a mold in order to, to create, well, you know as well as I do, artists are brands. And, and it's really fun to write for a brand, to a brand, with a brand. And it's great, There's, it's very artistic. But it's also very freeing to just sit in a room with one of your best buddies who's really talented and try to write a great song. Kick out ideas, kick them back and forth. And, and, and when you get the great one, you go, Wow, carrying your love with me, that's a pretty good idea. Let's, let's just do a metaphor about a bag and, and, and that sort of thing. And so, so what we're trying to do at NSAI with our advocacy is to, is to help monetize and continue that process so that, that at least that will still exist for as many of us as, uh, as possible. So the mechanical thing changed. Um, I'm afraid the performance, which is what's carried us for the last 10 years, the performance part of the, of the equation is gradually diminishing a little bit um, just because you're going to see something called direct licensing come into play, which says, for instance, Sony Music can say, well, for this particular Muzak-oriented DMX, for example, which is a case that's in court right now, for this particular service, uh, I'm going to license all of Sony songs separately, which makes a judge say, OK, ask Kevin BMI, you, you know, we're not getting your whole repertory. Now we're just getting everything but Sony, so your, your royalty rate is cut in half. Direct licensing um, could be the best thing. Nobody knows yet. That's why it's a Gutenberg moment. It could be the best thing that ever happened to music. It could also destroy the collective bargaining powers of the PROs, not that they have meant much bargaining powers because they're under a consent decree. One of the reasons that I think NSAI is so important, and I know I'm rambling, uh, but one of the reasons the circle is so important, the legislative part, is that for songwriters, it's all about legislation. We, the way we get paid is all in the hands of the U.S. Congress. It, it, the, the mechanical statutory rate is 9.1 cents for all songwriters and publishers. That means if there are two writers with publishers and you have a platinum record, you make like 27 grand. 
I just sat in a room with a guy who writes for Jason Aldean and got his first platinum plaque. And he'd been writing for 22 years, really hitting it. And his first platinum plaque. And uh, he'll make 27 grand, <laughs> which, which is a, a, you can cost that out. It's not a lot of money. We, those are some of our elevator speeches that we, take, that we take to Congress to try to convince them that, in my not so humble opinion, the, the pie is not split properly. When we went into the rewriting of, the, of Section 115, which is the digital part of the copyright law, which didn't pass, it was a bill called DEMA a few years back, one of the things we suggested was, you know what makes sense? Songwriters and publishers get a third. Artists and record labels get a third. And the wonderful folks who market and sell the, the product get a third. Um, if, if we could instill that into the consciousness of America, we'd have a, we'd have a more vibrant culture because you, you know people are not going to be songwriters if they don't get paid. An, an interesting thing we were just talking about is for the film score uh, uh, portion of it, they, they were very uh, diligent about telling you to join ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC, and <clears throat> that's definitely the truth. But in five years, when you're downloading films and television shows to your smartphone, your mobile device, the the uh, the Contis, the the all the wonderful folks that were up there, um, well, they don't get any royalties. There there is no performance royalty in an audio visual download which is one of the things NSAI tries to point out. And when the time comes to pull the trigger, we'll go after them for, for that. Because when people stop watching on cable, where, where, where there's a royalty, and stop watching on broadcast, where there's a royalty, and start going to their smartphones, no money. Sorry. So an entire segment, a wonderful segment of our, uh, of our creative community is going to lose some of a, a big portion of its income. It's, it's going to be. Here's your, here's your 50 grand for the score. That's all you get. And they, they really do depend on the, uh, on the performance royalty. So those are the things NSAI does. You're kind of getting a feel for why <coughs> I got sucked into doing so, so much work with and for NSAI, because uh, I, I really believe in, in the mission. It's a 40-year-old it's a organization, and the, uh, the motto is it all begins with a song, which I think is true. Um, Another big difference in monetization um, between now and 10, 12 years ago is, is the, the micro pennies that we get. My statement from I wrote for Warner Chapel Music for 22 years, and, uh, and they were a great partner. And my statement, which used to be, ooh, maybe an eighth of an inch thick and, and might represent a reasonable six-figure amount is now about this thick and might represent one-fourth of that. Because the, all the digital models are paying in micro pennies, you know, 0.001 cents per play. So you, you have this big, thick statement, which means more, it costs more money to administer. It costs more money for all the business and the paperwork part of things uh, to uh, to administer all that, and sometimes it isn't even worth the trouble. In, in other words, sometimes it's just, uh, it's like if you, if you have a little bit of digital play and it's a class action lawsuit from Sirius XM and you only had a couple of songs during those years, you know, your, your half hour to fill out the paperwork isn't worth the money that you're going to get. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. But the point is, we're, we're in a micro penny world, so I'd encourage the entrepreneurial uh, uh, spirits in all of us to, to think of ways to create efficiencies in, in the music administration, to learn about how your, what your songs are worth, what your, uh, how you get paid, where you get paid, all, all those kinds of things. Another, another program I'm involved with, it's a shameless plug, but I'd like you to go online and at least look at it, is a, is a thing called MyWorks, W-R-X, M-Y-W-R-X, and uh, I'm on the board there as well. And uh, what they are is a, a great poor man's copyright, a great online service where you and your collaborator can agree, yes, we both wrote words and music, yes. Um, 
it's 50%. Yes, this is the title. Because you'd be amazed how, mu how, how much money is, is in the coffers in, in Italy and Mozambique because somebody spelled my name with a T instead of a D. Or, or because our song was, I love you, and I wrote, I love you a lot. And, and, and when things don't disagree, if there's, in the music industry, if there's a, any way to just take the money and shove it all over here and go, well, let's just hang on to that. They'll do that. There's, in fact, there's a term in publishing called the float. Float. And uh, that's the 3% that, that uh, major publishers and sometimes record labels um, make on the money while it's sitting in their, their bank account waiting to go to your bank account. We have the technology for, to, be, to pay royalties just like, uh, just like watching your Starbucks coffee come out of your checking account online. We have the technology to do that. We have watermarking, we have fingerprinting, but legacy institutions often don't have the will to make those changes. It's going to be up to you guys to help us make those, those changes legislatively. Um, I think one of the other changes you're going to see that we already see are less of this, less of the star, the, the mega star, Taylor Swift notwithstanding, and she's wonderful. I've written with her. She's great. But we're going to see less of the Taylor Swifts, but more of uh, the I play a house party, I probably make six figures, I made my own CD, I own my own studio. I'm smart about business, so I kept my publishing administration, so I control what happens to my work, and so that when a music supervisor uh, wants to use something, I mean, there, there are literally shows like American Idol that, that there are major publishers that if they see the, the, uh, those three letters on the, uh, on, on the publishing information, they go, forget it, I'm not using that song. That would take me six months to get, just get the permission to use it. Where, where if it's John Paul Music and they got a phone number, they pick up, can I, can I use your song? 50 grand, okay. 20 grand, 10 grand. I'm being, I'm being a little grandiose there. Pardon the expression. Um, the other big change is uh, record labels have, have had to become entertainment companies. Um, you hear a very common term called the 360 deal. So that if you do get a, a record deal with a, with a label, they participate in other parts of the income. They participate sometimes and often in publishing. They sometimes participate in, uh, in merchandise uh, management. They, it can be structured so that there are tiers, so that it doesn't happen until you're already making a lot of money. But that's what lawyers are, are for. But hardly any, uh, hardly any record deals these days are just based on the sale of product physically and dig digitally. There's just not enough money in it anymore. Um, so the, the easier access is the good news. And we thought a while back that, that the selling of, sale of online product would put these 8 million bands worldwide on MySpace, would really put them on the map. And what it did is it created uh, a problem of selectivity. So what your task is, is, is to make yourself stand out from the crowd, because there are so many things out there. Out of the, I think it's 9,000 albums came out um, last year, only 600 sold over 1,000 copies, <laughs> which is not very many. So you got to figure out a way on, with an online present, presence with new media, um, you know, obviously Facebook, all that stuff. You got to figure out a way to, to stand out from the crowd. And, and that's, that's the essence of, of who you are m musically. And, and, and I'll kind of, the last brilliant but difficult question John Paul asked was, uh, was about truths. And one of the truths is um, you have to write from your perspective and from your emotions. And the whole idea of a song, the only thing that makes a song a great song is does it evoke emotion? Does it make you feel something? Do you want to dance? Do you want to cry? Do you want to laugh? Do you want to make love to your girlfriend? 
any of those things, that's all good. But it doesn't have to be all about you. The difference in a specific artist, a pop artist, an alt artist, writing for their project, it can very well be all about them. But it may not be a hit if it's all about them. It's all about how much they like the smell of marigolds in a New Orleans, rain, New Orleans rainstorm on a Friday. We're, we're pretty narrow here. It may, may be beautiful, and it may work for their fans, and they may do well. But the, the, the idea that I kind of came up learning about songs and songwriting is the hit song. And the hit song is something that your specific emotion, your specific experience is, is inside it. But you broadened it out so that uh, everybody could plug in what they feel. So that, so that people, and especially in, in the genre I primarily write in, in country music, especially in country music, you want people to go, God, I wish I'd have said that. That's exactly how I feel about that. I, I, I wish I'd have said it that way. And, uh, or, or you want, or you want, a, you want a, a big uh, strapping brute who's exhausted from a hard day of work to come home and hit, the, hit play and say, honey, listen to this song. This is how I feel about you. So th that's that, the one tip that I can give you. The, the coin of the realm in songwriting is the idea. Now, that might be a musical motif for some people, which is great. Or it might be a title. That's the old school way. Or it might be a concept that you have to kind of craft into a title that becomes a hook. But the, but the main thing is that it's something everybody can plug into and that you can, you can uh, write a, a, a cogent uh, single metaphor that, that flows through the whole thing. So um, I didn't even look at my notes, and I'm probably, have I gone over? I got one more time? Well, um, the, other, the other truths that I found is, uh, are things like, I love collaboration. I, I can't help it. I probably write three songs by myself a year. Everything else is, is collaboration. And there, there are many beauties to, to finding a, a like-minded spirit, someone who maybe you should either love them or hate them. You shouldn't have a an odd relationship. You should either be competitive or you should, you should want them to succeed with your success. E either one of those works, great, but uh, if, uh, if you have not a thought in your head that day, often your buddy will or your, your, co your collaborator will have some kind of a thought or will have a lick or will have read. I had a number one record because my friend um, had just written, had just read Lonesome Dove and he was playing a a little riff with, and the rain sound like the sound of a lonesome dove, because he liked, he liked those two words together. And we wrote a song called To You Cry around it, which was a number one record for, you never heard of this guy before you were born, but Eddie Raven. But uh, there are a lot of ways that collaboration can really keep the juices flowing. And, you know, songwriting is, uh, it's an art, and people are born with it, and people think it's, it's really all about talent. It, it is a little about talent. It's a lot about persistence. It's a lot about craft. It's a lot about doing it every single day. So that, that's really the, the two tips that I, that I could give you. Emotional content, don't be afraid to feel stuff. And then when you feel things, you're really sad because you had to take your dad's car keys away. Because he's so old, he can't, you know, you, you, caught him, you caught him half lost in your neighborhood. So you said, you got to say, Dad, I had to take your car, I got to take your keys away, You're, it's not safe anymore. So that brings up some kind of a deep emotion. And the other day I wrote a song with that moment in it, but broadened it out. It's called You Can Feel the World Changing, but you're standing still about how we, we're, we're standing still, but, we, but our lives change around us sometimes. The world keeps turning, and we're standing still. So what I'd encourage you to do is to feel things, have relationships, have emotions. Dallas Frazier once said, a songwriter is, is just a head with great big ears and nothing in between. 
So you're listening all the time for what people are saying, what people are feeling, and then you're trying to change that, change it, expand on it, make it into a universal metaphor, a universal words and music situation that everybody can understand and like. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. All right, our next speaker uh, is sort of a different take on the songwriting world. She spent uh, over 20 years, well over 20 years, uh, working in the professional music industry before she uh, started her own venture to try and give songwriters and music writers and uh, lyric writers and anyone who is involved with songs a new way to, uh, to work with their material. Uh, I'll let her tell you more about it. Please join me in welcoming Andrea. Andrea Stanley. Is it working? I have to get something here to show you an old relic, like me. <laughs> A veteran. Yeah, veteran. Yeah, I did work in the music industry um, for 27 years, and it was awesome. I will tell you, I worked for a record company for Warner Brothers Records, uh, and as much as the record industry now is sort of um, evil, uh, in a sense, when I started, it was uh, not evil. It was just a phenomenal place to be, and I was around with bands like Van Halen and Prince and Madonna and uh, sat in rooms with Eric Clapton, and they used to come to our a little uh, uh, patio area, and they would sit and play for us and sing, you know, acoustic sets, and, and that was my gig. When I was growing up, we were really entrenched in the music and the creative aspect uh, of music, and so the label for me was a phenomenal experience. And then my kids, of course, I would take them to all the gigs and the shows and, and, and the things, so it was awesome. Um, I'm, uh, that's part of my experience, and I'll explain it to you, but I, even before the label, uh, and once he gets the PowerPoint presentation up, because that's my cheat sheet, um, I can explain it to you. I, I, I'll start, and do you find it? Oh, yeah, we're here. Oh, what do you know? There we go. Well, that's my, that's my new business, and we'll get to that in a minute. It's about uh, creating and collaborating and inspiring, and I think that's what uh, music is all about. Um, a little bit of history about me. When I was 11 years old, my mother's friend has an old guitar and said, you know, I'm not using this, and gave it to me and taught me D, C, and G. And for hours and hours, and, and I just kind of resonated, and before I knew it, I was hooked. I was totally hooked. I say down here that I found that uh, I could not not create music from that point on. And I think that if you're here in this room, you're probably of the same mindset and, and understanding. You can't not create music. You can't not write songs. It's like breathing. Uh, and if that's where you're at, then you are a songwriter. Uh, success has nothing to do with it. Money has nothing to do with it. If you are writing and you're doing words and you're putting melodies together, you are a songwriter. Embrace that. You're lucky. You're one of the few. There are not a lot of us, really. We, we, there can be. I think everybody can write a song, but there's not a lot of people that do what these people do, that you do. And that in itself is what I call having your cake baked. Okay, your cake is baked, and we of course want to frost the heck out of it with a lot of money and success, but you're starting from a really great point, so I, I embrace that. It's kind of cool. Ah, my teen years. 11, a year, 11 and go to teen years, I was writing songs and I was kind of thinking outside the box and my brother was a great guitarist, he was just phenomenal, he still is. And he, of course, formed this band, everybody forms a band. And so I would find where I be, was able to get my creative outlet and I would write songs with him, you know, in, in a band, it's always cover bands you, because that's what everybody knows. But I got to write the one or two originals that uh, they would go and play and it would be rock or pop or country or something. So it was, it was a blast. Um, the thing I was always doing, though, as a kid, and, and still do it, and I'm a little half-cracked, so I like that. It makes life very interesting. Is I would scheme to try and get my songs heard outside the industry. I thought, you know, to become a songwriter, there's things that you need to do. I want to get my songs heard. So even back then, I told my brother, let's create musical greeting cards. Let's break open as songwriters in the greeting card industry. 
So I uh, convinced him, which was kind of hard to do. I convinced him, let's write eight songs like, you know, I love you, missing you, happy birthday, Merry Christmas, and let's go find a uh, company that will kind of listen to us. We'll do original songs, and we will break open as songwriters in the greeting card industry. Uh, I went and found a greeting card distributor. I went and designed a package. He was busy at that time. Um, you'll probably love this. Uh, it was in quarter inch tape. He was using drum drops, which was vinyl record, to create the songs and doing instruments. And he had to do this all this work. And I was out being creative, finding the packaging, finding a greeting card company. I even contacted Hallmark, who um, said, you know, I, I love this idea. I think this is a really cool idea. But we want to take it in, and we'll do the stuff and everything else, and you'll get like maybe three to four cents um, a sale. And I thought, are they nuts? Three to four cents a sale. I'm going to do this all myself. Biggest mistake of my entire life. Okay. But, you know, it's, it's all right. It was a lesson learned. I, th I think there are actually no mistakes. I think that we go through a process in our writing and anything we do in life, and I don't look at them as mistakes. I look at them as, well, we didn't do that, and what did I learn from that? Um, and we'll leave it there, yeah. The, we did end up doing greeting cards. I did end up creating, and you'll, you'll know that how old I am by looking at this, uh, creating the card. I came up with a package, which was a vinyl package, okay? And it had the card inside. And it was a 45, because when I was doing this, that's what you had. You, got, you, you bought singles, 45s. And we had a graphic designer that would, would design the, the front. And then my brother and I, we went and pressed these records, Rainbow Records, okay, with colored vinyl stuff. And we actually sold them in like places like May Company and things like that. And then overseas, I went to this great, these great gift card shows, and we started selling these. We were so successful that we went bankrupt. And there is a truth to this, and there's a reason I'm saying that. Um, yeah, you can stop there. Okay. What happened is, and it's a real important lesson, okay? We tend to get really creative, and we love our creativity to go, and we do things that are creative, but we don't balance it out with an understanding of business. And exactly what you were talking about. You must understand, if you're a songwriter, and you're in this business of songwriting, and you're doing anything creative, it's one, and you're an artist, whatever you are, that's great, but you're gonna be doing it all by yourself, and you're gonna be making no money if you don't marry yourself with an understanding of marketing and business and promotion and everything else that goes with it, it's, it empowers you. And even if it's not you, partner with somebody that has those strengths. Because, uh, like I said, we sold, and in, in one of the reasons that we were um, so successful that we went bankrupt is that people love these cards. But in the greeting card industry, every two months, you had to come with eight new cards. They, they weren't in the music business. They didn't, re, they didn't care that these were selling out and that they should just replenish with the same cards. In their mindset, it was, no, I've got, you know, you've got eight cards. Well, in two months, you've got to bring me eight more and eight more and eight more. What does that mean to me on a creative level? I have to, you know, kill my brother who's going to do eight songs every two weeks, and it takes him at that point about one song every 10 days because he was splicing tape and, and doing it. So there was no way that we could keep up with the demand, so we failed. Now, it was a great success within the failure and a, and a great lesson learned. Business, understand the aspects of business. Understand what Steve was saying also about how you make money and how you can you know, do things better by, uh, uh, by learning the business aspect of it. Um, adulthood. Uh, as I got older and I, I married young, I was 20 when I got married, my husband said, I love what you're doing with your brother and the music and writing these two songs for, you know, the band that's in the garage next door. Um, but we need to eat, so get a real job. So I was real fortunate to live in Glendale, California, and that was about 20 minutes away from uh, Warner Brother Records. And I thought, if I'm going to get a job and I'm going to earn an income, I'm going to do it in music. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Warner Brother Records, I'm going to get a job there, and they're going to discover me as a great songwriter. So I did. I went to Warner Brother Records. I interviewed for the international department, and I lied through my teeth. Can you take shorthand? Sure I can. Can you type? Of course I can. All this stuff, because in my mind, which I think is a, a, something I want to really say to you guys, I think you should tell people what they want to hear to get where you want to go, okay, if your intention is true. 
And what I mean by that is that everything I told the, in the interview, I can type, I can take shorthand, I knew that I would have to go learn that and have to go do it. So my intention was, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do a great job, but I'm going to do whatever I can and say whatever I can to get where I need to go. I think that you know, often we're way too polite and we're way too courteous and we live within these little walls. You probably don't because you're more the creative person. But we tend to hear and, and trust people when they say, no, you can't do it that way. I'm here to tell you, don't listen to anybody who tells you, no, you can't do it that way. And especially in music and in any, any place you go, you want to do it this way, you go do it this way. And you want to figure out how to get there, you figure out how to get there. If your intention is true, um, I break the walls down. Do what you've got to do. I did. I got inside Warner Brother Records, and, and uh, I was not discovered as a great songwriter. I found that everybody sitting in every desk and everywhere was a great musician, songwriter, rock star, or whatever it was, and it was just about the business of music. And I learned um, to love the business of music, and I found out that I was really good at it. So I had this career, and I started in the international department. And the international department is a mini label. And within the international department, you do everything in this one department that the company is doing individually out here. So inside a record label, you might be in, there's a marketing, and there's a production, and there's a A&R, and there's a merchandise, and there's these little bitty departments. International is one little thing. So the eight of us were doing everything, and it was kind of a fun thing for me to learn. Uh, and I loved it. And I did everything. I, I took bands on tours. Um, I was in recording sessions. Um, I went overseas and, and, and you know, did some interviews with stuff. I then did promotion and marketing and video and sort of kind of became a jack of all trades in the industry. And I loved it. It, it was just a wonderful creative thing. You can go ahead. Ah, and I was married to a programmer. And uh, that was also a very cool thing. Warner Brother Records in, in the late 70s and early 80s um, was just getting into the computer age, just getting into computers. And um, my husband was a programmer, and he was learning how to do you know, programming and design. So I had this great idea that we wanted to network the international department. And it would be the first time that the, any company had been networked at that level. And I talked him into it. And so that he came in and worked with the IT staff there, and I did the analysis of, of the department. And so we took all of our eight people's um, individual jobs, and we kind of had them input into this one system. So my boss, instead of having to run out to all the eight people and to find out, well, what are you doing, what are you doing, he could actually use the computer system and learned, you know, hey, they're doing this, this, and this, and, and it was a kind of a cool thing. So I, we, we were the first department to be networked at Warner Brother Records, and, and I did that with my husband based on me, you know, again, lying in, with intent uh, and letting them to get me to do it. It sort of uh, sealed our fate in the uh, company. Um, the last 10 years that I was at Warner Brother Records, um, they sent me around to most of the departments, and I did a lot of the analytical work there. And my husband came in and built uh, standalone access databases that actually run the departments today, um, merch, a &R, production, um, a catalog and all kinds of things and my husband's still there today and my two daughters work there and uh, it's been that's why I say it's been very good to me uh, but within all this and doing all this thing you can go ahead and switch um, oh I got to back up creating means never having to say you're sorry it is true I lost money on this and we went bankrupt on this but I was showing this to a friend at Warner Brother Records and one of the production guys production VP came in and said that's really cool um, let me take a look at that. I said, hey, thank you so much. And he said, you know what, I, we're doing a special packaging gig, and we're going to use this for a bunch of releases, and thank you so much, and I'm going to pay you for it. And I thought, thank you so much. Uh, made a little money back on what I went bankrupt of, but we used those packaging for, like, Hot for Teacher, Van Halen, a couple, um, uh, one, uh, um, you don't know the band, um, I even forget the, the name of the band now. It was a, uh, it was a country band. It'll come to me later. Um, but uh, it, it's cool, it's interesting. Whatever you create sometimes will come back around. So um, never worry about something you create not working at a certain time. It may find its way. It's kind of a cool thing. Uh, I never left songwriting. 
from that, that 11-year-old kid, okay, I was at Warner's, I was working in music, it was wonderful, but every waking moment I wrote songs. I continued my passion. I went to Nashville at least twice a year. Love that city and you guys should go. If you're songwriters, you should go. I don't care what you're writing, you should go. And I'll explain that in a minute. But I continued to cut demos, to network, to co-write, to pitch songs, to do what I needed to do to express this thing in me that I could not not do. At that point, I discovered what's going to lead us to show you what this niche business is that I've developed. Um, Nashville Recording Studios forced me to keep what were called backing tracks. Um, it was the best practice in the world. They, you'd come in and the session players would come in and they'd create the instrumental backing tracks and it's great. And then the singers would come in and they would sing. Most exhilarating experience I've ever had. Um, to watch your thing, your little melody and lyric that you do on a guitar and vocal, come to life with these professional people and, and these musicians, another, another art that, that adds to what you do. Okay, I used to always say they would write the songs, not me. I, I'd give them the lyric and the melody and they'd come bring life to it. Um, and they would say, look, you know, the singer may, you may want to change this down the road, but you need to keep your backing tracks, keep your instrumental tracks. Because uh, if uh, one of the singers gets a deal and you're not going to be able to use them again, you can come back and recut it. So I would say yes. And over the years, I accumulated about 300 um, really cool backing tracks, instrumentals, which were really great sounding. I would um, take these songs and pitch them. And you'd go in one door in Nashville. Has anybody been to Nashville? I know you're there, but you've been there. OK, so you guys know. You walk in one door and out the other. You go down the row of all these places. You've got publishing companies one right after the other. And I would spend days where I would maybe do 10 or 15 meetings a day. And I'd go into one door, and the guy would say, God, I love the, the track and the melody. I'm, the lyrics are not moving me. Go in the next door, the lyrics are moving me, but the melody's not doing anything. I mean, it's just all subjective. But if I heard an underlying theme that maybe the song's not working, I would also hear an underlying theme that the track is, that I like the track, you know, but the song's not working. So I would go back, I would, I would take the backing track, and I would create a whole new melody and lyric inside that track. And I would take it back to the same pr publisher a week or two later and say, here's a new song, not telling them that it used the same existing track on a song that they just passed on. And nine times out of 10, I'd get holds, or I'd get keeps of new songs that I created using the same exact tracks. So about 2005, um, I was doing this again. I was going through old catalog, and I was going to go back to Nashville and, and, and was going to cut. And I thought, wait a minute, you know, why don't I offer these tracks to songwriters around the world and see what they can do with them, use it as sort of a collaborative idea. And uh, that was my aha moment. So I went back to Warner Brothers. And I'd been there for 27 years anyway. And I said, I'm going to give you a six-month notice. Um, and I'm going to start this new business called Songs, Inc. I want to offer backing tracks and go around and start gathering tracks from people that have created songs that maybe haven't done anything and offer them to songwriters around the world for inspiration and collaboration. I uh, did a, oh, that's OK. You can, you can click it off. Long story short, I actually designed, a, 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 as I was designing the website and the idea, as I was working with music um, attorneys to try and put this together and make sure that it was legal and sound, uh, and figuring out a way to do this so we could protect the assets of, the, of what I wanted to offer, which are the instrumental track assets. Um, we launched live. We actually, I went to, uh, to Broadjam. You guys are familiar with Broadjam or Taxi? Anybody at all? Broadjam and Taxi are the business, and I'll back up. The business of getting into the music business, I think, is bigger than the, uh, the music business itself. Um, you got taxis and Broadjams and all these companies, Reverb Nation, Root Music Now on, on, on Facebook. All these, all these companies are, are in business to try and, and open doors for songwriters and people to get heard and to listen. Okay? It's for all the people outside the industry that haven't made it yet. And it's huge. I mean, you know, if you talk about a label, a label carries maybe 200, maybe 200 acts, 173 acts. Out of that, maybe 3% are in the money. That's, that's generally true. That's pretty scary. And support the rest of the label. And then out of those 275 or 175 acts, you've got, what, about a million outside the door? You've got people in this room trying to break into the industry. So it's, it, the business of getting into the music business is huge. Um, 
I went to Broad Jam, which is a big independent uh, uh, indie songwriter, um, one of the biggest songwriter sites, indie songwriter sites uh, in the world, about 115,000 members. And I put one ad and I got about 150, 200 uh, members and then did a live beta test with Songs Inc., which is the new company, how I named it, to uh, see how it worked. And I spent about two and a half years fine tuning it in a live environment. And then eventually, um, 2010, I did a major launch. I brought in major partners. Uh, Jonathan Stone, I don't know if you know Jonathan Stone. Yeah, it's a sweet, wonderful guy, major publisher, sweetheart guy, knows the music business inside and out. He kind of hooked up with us and uh, became our advisor. And we started gathering all of these uh, instrumental tracks. And we launched this, did a major site design, and launched October of 2010, uh, Songs Inc. So what Songs Inc. is, it's a new and fun and challenging way to write songs that also creates instant worldwide collaborations and monetizes non-earning assets. If you have ever, uh, Nashville, I went to Nashville, I wrote songs, I went and did work for hires, okay, made sure they were work for hires, got the instrumental assets, and now I'm offering them to you. You take a listen to that asset, you hear it, and you are inspired to create a new melody and lyric that's inside that asset. It's a pretty, pretty cool thing. But in the meantime, when you listen and you download that asset, you're paying me a small fee. It's about nine bucks. But I'm earning money with an asset, okay, that never earned me any money, and that's inspiring you to create new songs. Uh, master owners, which are the ones that own the instrumental assets, they can earn uh, like 40% of every download fee. It's about $1.67 would be the least amount of money that the master owners earn when they, when they get downloaded. They also retain in this model that we created a percentage of every song created that's inspired by their track. And then the songwriter can use the track, and the way that we use it legally is, is as a sample in the production of their new song, Demo Master. But it's a really cool way you can go ahead. It's a really, really cool way to, to create a song. It's not the only way, but it is a cool way. And it actually hooks you up with people all over the world that uh, you, you would never talk to or never reach. Um, we have two products. It's fully produced instrumental tracks and it's melody tracks. And the melody tracks are those instrumental tracks but with predominant melody lines above the track. So if you're a lyricist and you want to create a song, you just add words to, those, to that melody and there you go. Um, we, as a company, because we're connected, we have a lot of people that we work with, and, and because of my relationships in the industry, we take the songs, the really great songs that are created, and we have a, a, an awesome rating system, and we work them. We send them to song pluggers, to music supervisors, to whoever we can. We've got Jonathan Stone, uh, is another guy who's got a lot of contacts and, and is trying to work them as well. We advise and mentor. Uh, Jonathan Stone does a lot of things on the site that they t he talks to songwriters about and we try to educate you the way that Steve was saying, get educated, copyright, do this, do that, learn the business side as well as be involved in the creative side. Um, you, can miss, you can slip this one, but this one here, I, I was wondering if you'd like to hear two songs by members, okay, that, using one track. And this is one member in England downloaded this track and one member in Philadelphia actually downloaded this track. And they created two different songs. It's about 45 seconds of each. You're going to hear the first song, and then you'll hear the second song kind of segue in, and it'll give you an idea of how one track can, can inspire two songs. If it works. You've got to have the... Uh, okay, let me get this real quick. Yeah. Do a little... There are these uh, two songs in here. Yeah, that one. Perfect. That's easy. Member songs, member demos. And maybe not. No, we'll get it. <laughs> I'm committed. Uh, not committed to this, though. Let's just save it and open it with Flash. All right, John Paul. Hey. iTunes. Or Windows. Are 
Are you guys getting any speed up there? Just, oh, it Time to start forgetting. Sorry. Here we go again. Let's do it. I'm kneeling down with my heart in my hands. I'm too afraid to ask her why. She never said, Dear John, it's what I'm getting. Never said, it's time to start forgetting. For 13 months, we were fighting in the desert. We were fighting for each other's lives. We're risking all just to keep another breathing. We're winning medals, but it's just another sort of grieving. And all I know is my family and my friends and the children that I hope to have. It's what kept me alive through the days, through the nights. It's the woman that I love and the ones I'm holding dear. I give my heart away, oh, I offer her a diamond ring. But her silence tells me what her words never say. And all I'm holding now is a bright and shiny thing. I give my heart away, oh, I offer her a diamond ring. But her silence tells me what her words guy. never say. And all I'm holding now is a bright and shiny thing. I was torn inside. I wanted love, but wasn't sure. But your love helped me see what life and love could be. To share our ups and downs is what I'm living for. But we don't have much money, and our old car is shot. But I don't want for nothing. Everything about your love is everything I'm dreaming of. It's how love's meant to be. I found everything you have to give is everything I need to live. It's two very different songs. The track is exactly the same. It's it's the same exact track that you're hearing, but they're two songs. Now the the guy that owns the track um, has a percentage of each song. He owns 50% of the master using his track. And uh, it, it just expands um, uh, opportunities for everybody all over the place. So that's uh, Songs Inc., sort of in a nutshell, except for Pro Tracks, which if you have uh, the Pro Tracks, the movie, yeah, video, the, uh, quick right video, here. yeah. Um, we decided to expand it further, and that was, it was actually my original idea, is that I know that labels and artists and, and uh, producers and publishers, they, for every you know, 50 or 60 songs that are uh, a, a artist writes, and you can do this, Steve, and you, you probably do the same thing, for every, you know, you've written 50, 60 songs, maybe one or two are a hit, and you've spent all this money in production, and you, you've got all these tracks and this information, labels do the same thing, over you know 90% of their catalog is not a hit. It's just sitting in there and they're not doing anything with it. So take those tracks, repurpose and share with the world. Share with songwriters who will be inspired by them and use them and repurpose them and bring them new life and do what? And create new songs with them. To me, that's the coolest thing. You're collaborating, you're creating, you're inspiring with things that you thought were long gone, that, that, you, that were over, you can't do anything with. It's just, to me, it's just a cool thing. So we have pro tracks and we've actually gotten now major writers and artists and publishers and labels to give us their, those tracks, those assets, and to put them up on the site. And they have a vested interest, okay, to find the great songs that are written with them. Because if we can tell the story that here's this asset and John Smith out of, you know, o Ohio wrote a song that Faith Hill's gonna cut, okay, because it comes from the, the asset that's, con that's close to Faith Hill, well, what's going to happen is their assets, people are going to come more and download more and try and figure out, okay, they're really doing this, they're really listening. Well, the assets that are not earning any money, they're going to be earning money because they're going to be downloading that asset more and more. But then more and more songs are going to be created too. So it's kind of a win-win thing, and we love it. Um, if you play it real quick, it'll share with you the, the pro tracks aspect of what we do and kind of give you an idea of how the site works, and then I will get off this stage. Create, collaborate, inspire. Songs Inc. provides its members with an opportunity unlike any other. Write a song with music industry professionals anytime you want. When you create a song using Songs Inc. Pro Tracks, you're using the actual backing tracks created by professional songwriters and publishers working in the music industry today. These Pro Track owners produce, represent, and write with such artists as Taylor Swift, 
George Strait, Sir Mixalot, The Vandals, Christina Aguilera, Jason Aldean, and Jewel. The moment you create a song using a Songs Inc. Pro track, you have a partnership with a music industry professional. They have a vested interest in hearing and working with top rated songs created using their Pro Tracks. Every song you write using a Songs Inc. Pro Track is a collaboration with that Pro Track owner. You both share in the rights to that song as well as the revenue that song makes. How cool is that? So check out Pro Tracks for free and start writing a great song with one of our pros. It's as simple as finding a track you love. creating a melody inside that track, writing lyrics for that melody, and when you're ready, take the track into the studio and record the vocal. Song you walking down my street, just the kind I'd like to meet. The possibilities are endless. With eyes of blue, I think I like the look of you. I want to... Songwriters, lyricists, track owners. Create, collaborate, inspire. Songs in. So that song is sort of in a nutshell. And, and as I said, it's, it's not the only way to write a song. Um, it's just a different way to write a song. And that's what we're here for. We're here to figure out different ways to create, to get songs heard, to inspire the world or ourselves, and to figure out a way to actually earn a living doing it. Um, so I just encourage you all to do a few things. Learn about the business. Make sure that you understand how it works. Really, the, the music industry is changing, but it's still a business. It always will be a business. Figure out innovative ways to share and to collaborate and to work together and to bring songs forward. And understand that your cake's baked, that your starting point is that your cake's baked, and that you guys are really at a really fortunate place. And, and then lie your way into any place, anywhere, anyhow, as long as your intention is true and figure it out. Um, I just think that uh, we're just really lucky to be in this business and we're very fortunate to be writing songs and at, from that point uh, um, I'm just so pleased to be sharing this with you and to be here and to say thank you. Andrea Stanley. Thank you so much. Alright, we have one more uh, speaker for our, for our song portion before we get our panel. Uh, this man, um, for lack of better words, saved the day. Came in on the clutch and we're so excited to have him. He was named 2010 Songwriter of the Year by Offbeat. Offbeat um, is doing so many things right now. Uh, really hot writer on the New Orleans scene, if not the whole Southeast. Please join me in welcoming Paul Sanchez. Woo! Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm turned on. Well, you guys... Uh, you're very lucky. You just had the benefit of uh, two people's experience that have been in the business for a long time. And as much as Andrea said she loved the business, it was and remains a very brutal business. So to have survived for 26 years at one of the major record labels that ever existed is a major achievement. Uh, everybody in this room loves music, obviously, or you wouldn't be sitting here through all this talking. And hey, thanks. Uh, and this fellow here has done what many of us aspire to, which is to make a life of being a songwriter. Imagine that, an entire life of it. He's got to look back on all these records he's placed and all these things he's done, and what he's done with his position of success and his position of influence and his position of access is to now try and help other songwriters, and I think that's an amazing thing. I'd like to applaud you, Sam. What I most dig about seminars, and, I, and when I was younger, I didn't dig them very much because I wanted to be, man. I didn't want to go to no seminar. I wanted to play some songs. I wanted to be in front of people. I wanted to get to the next place, wherever that was. But as I get older, I like to listen to what everybody else is saying, what the, what the people ask. And the fellow that w was at the microphone for the film seminar was asking, how do I get there? I could hear the desperation in his voice. I had just walked in the room, and I could hear it from the hallway. And when I got in here, I could see it in his posture. How do I get from sitting right there to standing where Steve was standing? with all those beautiful records behind you, standing where Andrea is standing, where she's taken her lifelong passion for songwriting, and this is something really admirable, a lifelong passion for songwriting, and just to be near music, just to be near it, she stayed at a record company. And when it was her time to move on to her next pasture, she went right back to songwriting. And while still trying to place her own songs, she came up with something entirely innovative, which is to try and 
create songs using people from around the world. And just listening to those two tracks, that little sample you heard, how different a melody and lyric can be within the framework of one chord progression. Now, quite honestly, Western popular music is three or four chord progressions over and over again. That's how pop songs get to be pop songs. You go, oh, that sounds awful familiar. Well, that's the reason for that. What they both brought to the thing, and which each of you guys brought to this room, and which you're going to have to keep in your pockets for the rest of your life if you want to stay in music is passion. When he spoke about business, man, he was informative. I was digging it. I was like, wow, this is language that I'm learning. I hope these young people are absorbing this. But when he talked about songs, the sparkle in his eyes was there. It wasn't, it wasn't a guy who'd been in the business 40 years. It was that kid in his bedroom who just wanted that next lyric, man. Couldn't wait to write the next song. That's why he's still doing it. You dig? She talks about her experience of being 11 years old, writing with her brother. She's still doing it. So if you love it that much, because when I was graduating college, or not, I didn't graduate, when I was in college, I started getting gigs halfway through. My friends were all going to be doctors and lawyers and movers and shakers, and I started playing gigs, and I wound up dropping out. Sorry, shouldn't be saying that. But uh, <clears throat> the fact of the matter was, you know, 25 years later, when the economy hit the skids and my friends who had gone on to have 20 years worth of jobs got laid off without retirement, got told they were no longer wanted or used, they had a life of wishing that they had maybe pursued something they loved. And I didn't have uh, Steve's success in the business. I was in a rock band, and that's a really thin pie when you try and slice that. <laughs> and that band didn't work out so well for me after 15 years. I'm, I have about 11 albums and 20, 35, 40 songs that I'm not getting any of those wonderful different royalties he's talking about. Um, but I had a, an interesting thing happen in my life uh, that happened to a lot of y'all, is that uh, New Orleans flooded. I lost my house, I lost everything I owned, I had a suitcase and I had a couple of guitars, my wife and I. And my life became a do-over. I quit that band, I went to five lawyers trying to find out all the information that he already has. How do I get my publishing? Where's my royalties? Where's all this stuff? And I found that I'd signed it away years ago, that people had been keeping my money for as long as there had been money of mine to keep. And every lawyer told me the same thing. You could spend the next few years of your life trying to get that, but it's going to be a miserable experience. Or you're a great songwriter. Start over, write some new songs, build a new life. So in the last five years, I've written with John Boutte, who now sings the theme song of Treme Song. We've been in the Treme show a couple of times. We're going to be in a couple more times. Glenn David Andrew won a gospel album uh, award with a song that he and I wrote. Shamar Allen, uh, a band from Nashville. Uh, you talk about how stuff never goes away. 1992, I released my first solo record. It was on a small label out of uh, Atlanta. And uh, we sold 3,000 copies, which is, you know, pretty cool for a little indie label. And then, you know, life went on. And then after the flood, I got a call from uh, a lawyer in Nashville who said that his client was a big fan of mine and that he had uh, rewritten a song of mine for his own enjoyment. And I said, uh-huh. <laughs> and he said, well, uh, his manager heard it even though nobody was supposed to hear it. And I said, uh-huh. And he said, well, this band is getting signed to Universal, and they'd like to record your song. And I said, uh-huh. He goes, I know a lawyer from Nashville. It can't be good news. And I said, well, not in my recent experience, but please do continue. And so they turned out they wanted to give me credit. And I thought, well, cool. You know, it's been almost 20 years. I'll make a little money on the song. And they sent me the contract. And to be completely honest with you, way more unrecognizable than those two songs you just played me. All I really recognized was the first four opening notes and the lines, Jet Black and Jealous, which were the title of the song. Had I heard it on the radio, coming out of Nashville, I would have thought, oh, cool, somebody must have heard my song and used my title. Instead, they sent me the thing, and I got half the money, made more money off of their release of the record than I ever made off of my own release of the record, and that's because you got your work out in the world. I was, I was talking to John, and uh, I, taught, uh, I spoke at his uh, freshman songwriter class with Mr. Rankin, and before I came up here to talk to him, I said, get your stuff out there. You guys are so lucky. Not only are you in the internet age, not only are you in the YouTube age, Right now, YouTube is what MTV was for me 25 years ago. It's what kids tune into to find out what's the latest cool thing going on musically. The only difference is you don't have to travel all the way to New York with some manager who's got 20% in his pocket and a business manager who's got 5% and a booking agent who's got 10 just to get the one gig that pays you to get up there so that maybe you can get a meeting with MTV, so that maybe you can get a $50,000 video, a $200,000 video put on TV on 120 minutes once and hope that it impacts your thing. YouTube's there, man. It's happening, and you guys got this added advantage. The film industry has come to Louisiana. So you're getting tax breaks from into the millions for these guys to be here. So you're in a bar, you're hanging out with your friends, you're going to see some music. Right next to you is David Simon from the Treme. 
They're looking for music. They've been looking for music for years. These guys happen to be doing chronologically. But films are coming to town. So people say to me, young guys come up and they say, well, how do I get my stuff in films? Because that's how I happen to have made a lot of money in the last few years with, well, in, for most of my career. I never made it on radio. I made it through films and TV. It, you have to get it heard first. And you guys have more access to that than any generation, in, in my opinion, in the history of music. Yeah, you said it, that means that it's a lot more diluted stream. Yes, it is. But as, as Steve pointed out, so maybe that means no more giant megastars. Maybe you don't get to be Taylor Swift. And you would look beautiful in a blonde wig, I'm sure. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, as he said, house concerts and places to get heard and places to live your passion, to make six figures, to make whatever figures it takes. When uh, I was a young fellow, I was in a band with uh, Vance the Generous and Ivan Neville. And Vance has gone on to, you know, he's, he's, he's very successful out in Los Angeles. Ellen DeGeneres is his sister. And Ivan was following his father around the house, Aaron. And it was at a time when Ivan was just starting to play some keyboards with the Neville brothers. And Ivan was young, you know, we were like all in our early 20s. And Ivan's just pestering him, you know, he's following him around the house. He's like, Dad, we got to get some gigs. I need some money. And Ivan just keeps, I mean, Aaron keeps walking away. And Ivan keeps following him. He says, Dad, we got to get some gigs. I need some money. And finally, Aaron looks at him. He goes, you need some money? I hear they're hiring down on Julia Street Wharf. So fact of the matter is, when he didn't have a gold record, Aaron did work the docks. And so did George Porter Jr. And so did a lot of great musicians. There's no shame in having it a day job that gets you to the place where you need to get with your music. But every day, devote what, they, what they've been talking about. Learn some business, man. Because get up in the morning and find something out online you didn't know yesterday. Every single day, make sure you do something to get your music recorded, to get it filmed and to get it heard out on the internet. Because if it's just living inside of you, it's this little flower that's going to be there until it's so brown you forgot that it was ever pretty. But I promise you, if you get it out in the world, two years, five years, ten years, Maybe you'll make a lot of money. Maybe just somebody will come up to you and say, God, I heard your song on YouTube, and it just meant so much to me. It saved my life. It made me happy. It made me fall in love with my girlfriend. It made me want to write a song. Might not be money in your bank, and it might not pay your bills. I promise you, it will keep you going until that money comes. And if you do diligence, like Andre was talking about, due diligence, stay after it. If you learn the business, like Steve's talking about, and if you retain the passion, that I saw in them today, that I know that I feel and that I see already in faces out there that are listening intently, trying to find out how would I go from this notepad in my hand to that, my, to that studio, to that moment. There's a great film when I was a kid, uh, this actor, Tom Conti, he played a poet who had uh, dried up. He hadn't written a poem in 20 years, and he made a good living traveling the college lecture circuit, reciting his old poetry and seducing the wives of professors. He was a drunk. <laughs> His ex-wife decided to write a book about his life, an expose on their relationship and what it was like to be married to a drunk poet. So she came to see him, and he was still trying to put the moves on his ex-wife, still just a, a drunk, still trying to be a, his notion of what a writer should be when he was a young man. And she finally looked him in the face, and she said, you're like the little boy who dreams of being a great symphonic conductor, arms raised dramatically over his shoulders, forelock of hair falling over his head as he is poised to conduct the great symphony orchestra. But you never dream of the back-breaking work it takes to get to that moment. That's the thing to remember. It's all there waiting for you. And the journey to be where he is and he's going to continue to be is yours. A different journey, right? But it's back-breaking work. And it takes that passion to keep it going. It's 10,000 steps. But every one of them is important. And they're like this, man. You don't get to leap very often. Mm -hmm. Once in a while, you get to go, wow, that was fun. Oh, skip five. So stay with it. And I can't tell you any more about the business than they can. And there is no wrong way. There's different ways. And I, I, I like to use analogies because it, maybe it resonates for me because I'm a songwriter. I like to use imagery. When my mother was uh, very old. She was getting ready to die. We were very poor. I had uh, 11 uh, kids in the family, my five brothers and five sisters. My, I didn't have a father. And I uh, went to my mom when she was old, and I had a nice career in music at this point in my life. I'm, I dig my life. And I, I said to her mom, I just wanted to say, you know, thanks for not leaving us. You know, you're only 42 years old. When Dad died, you had 10 kids still in the house. And I don't know if I could have stayed for that. I think I, I, think I might have caved and split. And she looked at me, and she said, well, son, that wasn't for you to figure out. That was my life, and that was for me to figure out. Your life's for you. Figure it out. And that's what I'm telling you all. Your songs, your career, your life, and your choices are for you. This accessing information is a beautiful thing, but you've got to figure it out. And figuring it out don't mean thinking about it. It means when you leave this room,
do something. Write something, record it, get it out in the world. Don't stop until you got what you want. Maybe some of you don't want to be writers. Maybe you're here collecting information. What a great example she was. There's ways for you to stay close to this music you love so much. Especially now, more than ever, with the business diversifying. There's not just five record labels or ten record labels. There's all these different ways. So find your passion. If it's writing, do it. If it's just being close to music, then like she said, it's a lot easier to make money on getting into the music business than it is making music. <laughs> so uh, thank you all for listening. If you have questions, Lovely. thanks for having me. Wow, that's great. All right, if uh, you give us a few minutes to get our panel set up, we're going to listen me. to the uh, beautiful music of Paul Sanchez while it happens. Man, thank you. They don't know what they've been through. They don't know what they've been through. I Pull up the center feed and see if we have any uh, any more any more questions. Anyone listening at at uh, home can uh, send us a question through the center feed. Uh, I'll pull up the website right here. Well, rather, if you're streaming us at home, you know what the website is. All right, uh, we are ready to begin our songwriting panel, uh, panel questions here. I have a few from my email. If you want to ask, uh, feel free to come up to the microphones. Um, or uh, if you're from home, you can either send us an email at getinformed at gmail, or uh, you can use the chat box below the stream. Um, the first question comes from Stephen. And uh, Stephen asked, where, where are the... Where does a band go to pitch their songs? What are some of their avenues they should select? So uh, for the panel, where are places bands should go? What kind of band? That would be the first question. All right. Well, uh, it's a written sorry, question, so I'll, I'll, I assume it's an emailed question. Yes. So that's the first question you have to answer for yourself: is what kind of band do you have? And uh, when you decide uh, what that is, these days it's also compartmentalized, and you can pursue online because that's where all the information is these days the best avenues to pursue punk rock even has avenues that weren't that didn't exist five years ago because of the internet so find out who you are first as a good uh, and, and also I'd, I'd add to that um social media is the biggest new thing going i mean i like i'm telling you anything you don't know <laughs> but uh, the the point is that that legit a uh, big time uh management record labels are actually using um Facebook and MySpace and stuff, and they're looking at the hits, and uh, it, I mean, it works in the music world, it works in the book world. People go, hey, you only have uh, 5,000 
hits on your on your MySpace. It, it, you're not happening yet. So one of the big things you can do is get a lot of get a lot of friends, Facebook friends and stuff, and really really work that part of it. Get real fans. Go out a lot. Play a lot of gigs. Those kinds of things are things that people can do right from their own hometown to pitch themselves and not, you know, if you can't afford the ticket to New York, L.A. or Nashville. Yeah, there, there's a great company called Top Spin. I don't know if you guys are mm -hmm. familiar with it. Um, it's something to look up. If you're a band and you want to get out there and you want to use the tools to be able to use social media and networking and um, be able to get your music out there, I sincerely suggest that you look up Top Spin. Um, they're one of several resources, but it's run by a guy uh, by the name of Ian Rogers, who's just, uh, he's in this to get uh, bands and artists tools, and he's well connected, and I think you'll find the site pretty engaging. There's right. also TuneCore, Sonic Bids is mm -hmm. an interesting mm -hmm. um, model. TuneCore is an aggregator that'll get your stuff once it's recorded, Great. but uh, Sonic Bids is pretty cool as well. Right. Uh, do we have uh, audience questions? Did you uh, tell us your name and... Uh, what you do and what question you got for the panel. Hi, uh, my name is Kevin. Um, I just got a degree in composition um, and I'm a bit of a songwriter, uh, but I'm also a stand-up improv sketch comedian. And a lot of my songs are humorous in nature. And I was wondering, like, is there a market? What should I do? What can be done uh, with funny songs, basically? Great question. I, that, I think there's always been a market for funny songs. <clears throat> Back in the 30s and 40s, they referred to them as novelty songs. In the 60s, uh, people like Steve Martin, and he still does, cross over into, uh, into music and, and uh, mix up comedy occasionally still with his stuff. So there's obviously a market for it, and the market that exists is the same market we've been talking about. It's, it's the internet, especially for something like that, which is a unique thing. It's not something that's going to be a hit record per se, so you can't pursue the traditional channels. But what you do is entertaining, and if you can apply a visual to it, then you can put it on YouTube, you can get it heard and the chances, you raise your chances of being seen by somebody who's actually got a financed project. Perhaps that particular song won't be used in that project, but if you keep the music out there and you use Facebook, and I've, I've been very successful at this since the flood. Um, I didn't know anything about computers after the flood. MySpace was still burning up uh, right after uh, the flood happened in 2005, and Facebook was just starting. I remember talking to John about it a few years ago in lessons and saying, you really gotta pursue this thing, it's really exploding. So use the social media things, and create art, you know, create art that you get out into the world and have the patience to know that things do happen because that's the nature of life and have the confidence to know that they will happen and just keep putting stuff out there. Show up for every meeting you get offered, even if it sounds like it's going to be a drag. You know, if it sounds like a gig uh, that you might not even want, take the meeting because maybe you don't want the gig or maybe you don't even have a chance at the gig. But in two years, that meeting's gonna come back around. That fellow you shook hands with and were just polite and listened to is gonna have a job or a gig to offer that he's gonna go, ah, oh, I remember that guy, Kevin. He was really nice, we couldn't use him then, but he was real cool and he had some good ideas. Let's call him. So take whatever meetings you get offered, even if, they sound, even if it's a cup of coffee with somebody like Steve who might offer you advice. He's not offering you a gig or anything. Meet the guy because it's a friend's business I think most businesses are. We all in the music business, the entertainment business, like to think of ourselves as a friend's business. But doctors use referrals and teachers get hired by people that know them. And you know, the, the world operates on a comfort zone. You're good in the studio when you're comfortable with the people you're working with. You're good at a record label when you're comfortable. Like when we had a person, I was on a couple of different major labels. And if we had somebody with this kind of intellect and this kind of enthusiasm working our record, man, you could just go play the shows and relax and not do the business because she was gonna be on it. If you didn't, if you had that meeting and the person was sort of clueless and was trying to fit <clears throat> into some place you didn't fit, then it was panic time. So, yeah, I don't know if you had anything to add to us. I just think it's a perfect time uh, in the evolution of, uh, of music and entertainment to combine, uh, you know, Steve Martin did it, like you, like you mentioned. He, he just, Steve Martin just did a serious bluegrass project that's uh, getting some major uh, note. Uh, so I think it's a perfect time. You're loaded with, uh, you got three satellite stations dedicated to comedy full of serious XM stations, full of uh, uh, about every fourth thing is a, is a, uh, uh, a song. And the a internet's a, a, uh, Alice's, you know, looking glass, right? Y y yeah, you can, I was talking to John, he says, well, there's so many people on YouTube. Yeah, there is, but stay on the internet and keep digging because somebody on YouTube has the job of picking where they're gonna be the featured videos for the month. That person is very influential in our culture and that person is hard to get to. But she's just a person. In fact, she was in New Orleans two years ago for Jazz Fest, and she happened to come across Teresa Anderson, 
who at the time had about 300 hits on her Hummingbird video, she fell in love with it. She went back and she put it on as a featured video for a month and Teresa's album went through the roof. So make the art, but do the business. Find out how you can get it seen and then find out who that person is that can help you get it seen and then get to them. And not gonna be the first maiden, second or third. Maybe it will, maybe you'll get lucky. Luck's a big part of it, but it's persistence. Plus, yeah, you, plus you, you, get gigs. you get gigs, you can sell your, your CDs live. I mean, the, the, it'll get you a lot. It'll get you a lot of gigs. It's it's better for what you're doing now than it ever has been. Mm -hmm. I had a Warner Brothers cut about 15, 18 years ago. There was a band uh, duo called Pinkerton Bowden, and okay. their whole deal was uh, uh, was to do parodies. They did "She Thinks I Steal Cars," and <laughs> and just just because the motor's in my bathtub, she thinks I steal cars. Well, I, I got one of the only originals that they did. I, it was during the Imelda Marcos thing, and, and the first line of it is called Imelda Shoes, and it says there's a closet in Manila where it's lonely, cold, and dark. 3,000 pair of shoes are permanently parked. And it's, it's this serious kind of a, a funny thing. Well, it, it was a stiff. It was big in Boston, in New York, in L.A., but... Warners believed in it. They put it out as a single, but it was a complete stiff because the whole middle of the country at that time, before this incredible Gutenberg revolution we've had, they didn't know who Imelda was, even though she was on the right. news every night. Yeah, so uh, I think it's a great time for you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, YouTube. There's a guy by the name of Mike Lombardo. I don't know if you guys have gone on YouTube and watched him. He's, he's quite a, a songwriter, young kid, and uh, he's just starting to grow, and he does a few parody things, and, and his writing's really intelligent. I mean, that's the bottom line. We can sit here and tell you where to, where to do it and where to go, and you've got all the tools at your resources. Um, and now it's up to you to bring the product. It's always up to you to bring the product, okay, and uh, figure out a way to do it and to be clever with it and, you know, just do it. Put it out there. Oldest axiom in writing, publish or perish. Yeah. Ch Oldest go check out Mike Lombardo and, and go watch him and, and maybe call him. He's accessible. Maybe you guys can do something together. I mean, you know, that's the way you want to think. Yeah, don't be afraid to ask somebody. You know, don't be afraid to approach somebody and send them your stuff and go, if you ever pass them through New Orleans and you want to work together and... You know, you give him the opportunity to say, if you're ever up this way, don't be, you know, you might get a no, but It's like not. any gig. I mean, if I, if I go fight for the, like a Warner Brothers, I'll hide my way into Warner Brothers. Well, if I sucked, I wouldn't have been there that long. <laughs> no, if you got a good uh, idea behind it, you can, you can say whatever you want. If you got a good idea behind it, if, you, if somebody comes up and asks me to write, generally, I'm going to say no. But if somebody comes up and says, um, do you have 30 minutes for coffee? I think I have a killer idea um, anytime in the next couple of weeks because uh, I think I have a killer song idea. I'd just like to run it by you. Then they've got my attention. Hey, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, Karen um, from our email asked, uh, Hello, I'm a 26-year-old songwriter and I'm debating uh, moving to Nashville. What are some of the pros and cons? All Again, no, no music. No music conduct. We don't know what kind of music she plays. Uh, let me Thanks, answer. Karen. Let me answer it um, real quick. And, I'm, and actually, I'm not the pro at this, but I want to explain something. You know, I had a decision. I said that I married when I was 20, and I had to get a real job, so I, I lied to get into Warner Brothers. Um, but I will tell you something. That I was having some success, and when I was about 24, 25, and I had a whole, couple holes by George Strait, and and some things were happening. And I was told at that time when I was in Nashville, look, you know, come here. Um, I had worked for, record, for, for Warner Records, and I think it was Jim Ed Norman at the time was, was at the label. And uh, it, it, because I'd done some gigs, I kind of got friendly with him. And he said, you know, come here. I'll set you up with the writers. I'll do whatever you got to do. And I said, no, my decision. Okay, I said, no, I'm not, I won't do that. I've got two, two kids now, and I'm from the young family, and my husband's got this gig going, and I'm working at Warner Records here. And... I just don't think I can do it. I can make it by not going to Nashville. Um, I'll tell you what, if you're serious about it and that's really what you want to do, and I don't regret making the decision, but I will tell you that I think I might be saying something different here or being another kind of a personality here had I made that decision. No one will ever know, but it's important. Go where the opportunity is and follow through with that opportunity. I think it's real important to do that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I would uh, I would concur. Uh, I I did the other thing. I had two kids, four and eight, eight rooms of furniture, a total of five grand in the bank, and got a U-Haul, got in a got in a big truck, big wheel strapped to the back, and moved to Nashville wow. with no gig and no yeah. knowledge of whether I'd ever get one, and uh, it worked out pretty well. But it was a, a big leap of faith. Nashville is like the pros and cons are this. 
the cons is uh, the competition is very intense. Uh, there are less um, chances for standalone songs to uh, to be recorded and a little bit less money in the pipeline right now. The pros are it's a wonderful nurturing community full of creative people who share the instant the instant bond that the three of us can feel up here. It's a whole town full of those people. There's an organization NSAI where there's a building. You can use you, you join. It costs you 150 bucks a year. You join. You get your songs evaluated. You can record them. You got writers' rooms. You got people who will say you're not ready for this, but you're ready for that. Uh, so it, it's it's a it's a brilliant place. I, I love it. It's become my home, and and I would I would truly encourage you if songwriting is your dream, don't hold back. Also, uh, one has to decide what one wants for one's life. Uh, after the flood, I was sitting with a filmmaker friend of mine, a young, a young guy, he's uh, I think maybe 30, just turned 30, and he was wondering if he should maybe leave New Orleans because it was so bleak at the time, and should he maybe go to Los Angeles? And he'd gotten some advice from an artist who was older and a little bitter about having stayed in New Orleans. And I said to him that if you want to be Steven Spielberg and make $200 million films and win Oscars for the next 25 years, then yeah, you're already late for getting out there. If you want to be a guy who makes quality films that he loves and enjoys the pace of this life in New Orleans, which is unique to any city in the world, then you're in the right city. Um, another fella came up to me after a gig and he said, Paul, I've been coming to see you for so long. And I just got to ask you this. You know, I play drums. I'm like, yeah. He goes, well, I want to leave Baton Rouge. I want to live in Austin. And you know, I got a friend of mine offered me a gig. And I just think if I don't go, I'm going to regret it for the rest of my life. What should I do? And I said, well, you just answered your own question. So ask yourself the question, and if, if, the, if the answer inside of you is, I have to do this, I think you, you stressed that earlier, then you, then you have to do it. Yeah. If the answer is, I, I think I want to do this, then, then tiptoe a little more slowly, because there's plenty of ways to do it that don't involve going to Nashville. Nashville, to be quite honest with you, and with all due respect to two people who made their careers there, it did not work for me at all. And I'll tell you why. I wanted to be a songwriter, and I couldn't fit into anybody's pigeonhole. In fact, I just finished doing 24 songs on a musical, that I worked on that is 1965 to 2005 in New Orleans. And it was exhilarating for the very fact that I got to write R&B, gospel, jazz, hip hop, rap, all kinds of styles. I took meetings in Nashville for the 16 years I was in the rock band I was in because we did well. We were on a couple of major labels. And if you're on a major label, people in Nashville will actually let you in their office. And it started when I was 33. And my last meeting was right after the flood when I was 46. And at that time, the guy who was giving me the exact same advice I've been getting for 15 years was now 15 years younger than me. I'm sitting in a publisher's office who's maybe 10 <laughs> years younger than me, and he's giving me the same advice I've been hearing since I was his age, which was, if you want to come to Nashville, be prepared to live here for five years before you get a cut on anybody's record. It is a community, and it is a closed community. They will nurture, and they will welcome, but it's a long line standing to where you want to be. And this was, I don't know if you, if this, I'm going to be honest with, with you because this is what happened to me. This is what got told to me. The guy leaned across his desk, young fella, leaned across his desk and he goes, and I'm going to tell you right now, in Nashville, we don't want any fresh ideas. We don't want anything original. What's on the radio right now, that's what I want you bringing into this office. And I smiled and I thanked him for the meeting and I went back about my life. So, uh, and, I, and I've had a, a, a nice time of it. You know, I like the, the songs I write and I like that I'm making money off of it and my wife likes that too. Uh, but... But if you wanted the, the career that Steve's had, then you had to go there so many years ago as he did. And you have to be part of that community because there are dues to pay. That's the things people talk about. You can't just be you know, living in New Orleans or Oklahoma and send a song in and think somebody's going to recognize your brilliance off of your first song. It's persistence, due diligence, being part of things. And these days, make, being on the internet makes it a lot easier. You don't so much have to go to Nashville as you can maybe join Songs, Inc. and start meeting people from there. And that by the time you do go to Nashville, Steve and people like this know who you are, and it's much easier to get a meeting if you can walk in saying, hey, Steve, you got 20 minutes for coffee. What do I do here? And if he gives you that 20 minutes, Nashville door just opened for you. And believe me, they don't open off easy. <laughs> they open like this much, and they whisper to you. Oh, they whisper to you. Yeah, the compromise is go to some of the song camps uh, that NSAI puts out, uh, because it's just a trip, and it's a wonderful trip. You're going to be there with songwriters, and they're going to be right in front of you, and you're going to be co-writing and talking to them and hearing them and uh, spending a three intense day, you know, uh, experience. Um, and you don't have to move there. Good way you to put your that. toe in the water. Yeah. And there's very few cities besides Nashville. I mean, you know, play, being a musician in any town, being a songwriter is, is a difficult uh, road to choose because of the money, but 
at least as he said, you are in a very nurturing environment. I have a lot of friends who live in Nashville, and it is a very supportive environment. When I do go back there to either hang out or make music, you're surrounded by people who are doing the same thing and who are glad that you're doing it. They're not like trying to horn in your thing, they just want to be near it. And besides New Orleans, I can't think of too many cities that are like that. LA is extremely cutthroat. New York is it's got a music community, but you talk about a closed community and a really expensive one. So in Nashville, yeah, you might have to have a day gig to get by until that five years passes and you get that first cut, but you're gonna be surrounded in that day gig by people trying to live the same life. You're gonna learn a lot about yourself and about your songs, and that's not such a bad life to have, really, until the, the moment comes when you get to do the thing you wanna do. Right on, I hope that helps, Karen, uh, if you're listening. Uh, do we have a, another question? Uh, please tell us your name and your, which question is. Uh, I'm John, uh, and I was wondering, uh, there seems to be a multiplicity of approaches towards the music business, but as a songwriter, when you approach songwriting, do you have to be a, a gigging musician, or it's like, can you still make it as a standalone writer going into Nashville? I mean, you, you've talked a lot about that, but what, what would be like, what, what would make be the most efficient way cutting through the waters? Would you be gigging, or would you just be writing and going around the song circles and shopping? Each person's path is different, you know? Steve likes to collaborate and he likes to, uh, obviously from listening to him talk, he likes the actual art of writing. And that's what he spent his life, it sounds like, doing. Whereas I really like being on stage and singing my songs and telling the stories that go along with them. The standalone writer, I guess, is what you kept referring to it as. So you have to decide, once again, that, keep, that keeps coming up for me. Who are you and what is it you want to do? Because as they, kept, they said many times, there is no set way to go about it. And then don't let anybody tell you you can't. If you really want to do it, then be it and live it and go find out how to do it. Don't wait for somebody to give you permission. This, I can't stress enough. I waited for permission my whole life and the internet changed that for me. I didn't have to ask anybody's permission to write the kind of songs I wanted to pursue the path I wanted, which happened to be a different and unique path than the average rock band wanted to pursue and it didn't fit into what I was doing. So, no, I mean, I, I, is there, is there I think a way that's to ask I think that's a great answer. I, I, I mean, if, if you're living your life carefully and playing by percentages, then, then you listen to all that, that input, and if, and if that's the kind of person you are, you should be that kind of person. The percentage, uh, the, the percentage of, of writers who, who are not artist writers is, is going down. But ask Brett James, Rivers Rutherford, ask the, the 10 guys, well, ask me, I'm still, get, I'm still making money, and I'm an old guy. And you, uh, you may, there may, if there's only 10 standalone writers that are, that are rocking and, and, and are getting the phone Phones getting picked up by Sarah Evans and Tim McGraw, and and uh, you know all the all the biggest stars. You you just got to work until you're one of those ten if that's what you want to do. You know, people feel the truth. They they feel the passion. If you're in there trying to pretend to be something you're not, um, it, you're it's going to resonate that way with the audience. You're going to be okay. It's kind of a good guy, whatever. But if you're passionate and you're bringing it, and you are you know just your heart and souls into this thing, it tends to resonate with your audience. That's where you've got to start from. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Uh, uh, I know before very few before we answer that, I want to make sure that the people at home can get this, and so it's on the on the on the program. Um, the question is, I believe, how how are physicals being used? How are physicals changing? Um, what sort of role are are physical products going to play in the future of songwriting? Um, electronic press kits have been really the thing for a long time. I mean, it got to the point where people would call you and say, "Please don't send me any more paper press kits. It's just cluttering my desk." So that part of it has definitely changed. Electronic press kits are the way. And along with electronic press kits these days, it's not just photos, it's videos and songs and interview footage if you have that of yourself. And all that stuff helps because, you know, the thing of it is, the record company and the booking agents, everybody just wants their job to be easy. And we're just trying to be heard. So when you first meet a booking agent or a manager or a record company, you're going, I'm really good, I swear I'm really good. And they don't really care. What the booking agent wants to know is, where do you play and what size rooms do you play? because then I can call those size rooms in that part of the country and I can book you and I can spread from there. So you want to provide the information that makes it easy. Is a physical CD still important? I think uh, if, if you can do a physical CD that's, uh, and you do it reasonably and have it look respectable and sound good, uh, 
if you ask John Prime, he, he spent a whole career on major labels uh, getting 70 cents a record and selling tons of them. And then he, he started Oh Boy Records with Albanetta, and uh, the first one sold 500 grand, big 500,000. But the big difference, he didn't sell as many records, but he got five bucks for every record instead of 80 cents. So if you can make physical product reasonably and, and sell a thousand or 10,000, you, you just figure out where your profit point is and, and, and people will mainly buy them when you're physically there. Right. And they, and they want to have a piece of the experience they had with yeah, you. They're, they're still to take doing home. that. You know, they're on the road and they, house parties, anything else. Yeah. They're out there doing, here's 10 CDs today I sold. Here's 20 over here. However you can make it happen, make it happen using the physical or, or you know, the digital stuff. I think on a mass level, the CDs are clearly, you know, fading. That's what's reshaping the music business. But uh, for most artists, and particularly New Orleans artists, because people that come to New Orleans are already looking to bring something back from New Orleans with them. And uh, CDs for New Orleans artists are definitely like postcard souvenirs that people bring home with them. I think, uh, as Steve said, at house concerts and at, at shows, it's the point of purchase sale, as it's what it's referred to as, and you, your fans will do that. Um, I, and I also think like in the briefest sort of way and helping you get a gig, but the chances of somebody these days, even the promoters that are booking gigs are downloading. So it's, it's now ironically you mentioned vinyl and who would have thought the vinyl would come back and now Big vinyl research. is enjoying a, a resurgence. So if you have the resources, the financial resources to press, to press say 500 or a thousand CDs and maybe 200 pieces of vinyl, yeah, because somebody's gonna hang on to vinyl a lot more than they will CDs these days. They can d burn the CD and they don't even know where they put it. But the vinyl looks cool, man. And now people are buying the USB turntables, and it's, it's pretty yeah. interesting to old guys like us that the thing we love so Full much is coming back. I definitely Amazing. want to print up uh, uh, vinyl copies of Nine Lives, a musical I just did, just so I can have it on vinyl. You know, I, I'll go out of pocket for 100 of them just to <laughs> just see it on vinyl again. Cool. Yeah. Any more questions? All right, well, let, let's, get our, let's get our panel's perspective. A few words for our students. They're going to leave our symposium. What's the last thing you want to put in their heads? Let's go down. Steve, start us off. Figure out who you are. Find your dream and follow it. Uh, it's one step at a time. It's not easy. Be able to back up, what you, say whatever you want, and be able to back it up. But follow your heart. Follow your dream. Right on. Paul. I've been saying this to people for a long time. Dig what you do and do what you dig. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, at the risk of going all secret on you, um, uh, everything that you see in front of you was first a thought, which means that you can create anything if you put your mind to it. That's right. So uh, thank you all so much for coming out. Let's get a round of applause for our panel. Steve Bogard, Good. Paul Sanchez, oh, Andrea Stanley. If you have Good. questions, I'll be around for a little bit. You can ask away. Thank you for coming out to our Song and Score Symposium. Thank you. Thank you.